Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On this episode, we're joined by Tiffany Tan, a reporter for the nonprofit VT Digger who covers Southwest Vermont. Tiffany's career has taken her around the globe in the Philippines as a TV producer, in Singapore and China as a writer and editor. She's worked in the United States in both South Dakota and Vermont. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, Mark. So we're going to begin with how we always begin with every guest that we have come on. What's your journalism origin story? Well, I grew up in the Philippines. It's a province that's about an hour away by plane from Manila, which is the city that most people are familiar with in the Philippines. I loved the sciences in high school um, and considered going into medicine. Um, at the same time, I also loved writing. So in college, I joined a school paper and decided to remain a communications major because I really found the journalism process exciting. You know, talking to different people, pouring over documents, and piecing together information to find the big picture, the story. Then after college, my first full-time job was as a TV producer on an investigative show. I also worked on a documentary TV program, but eventually I decided to move to print journalism because I felt that I could work faster and more independently with just me, my notebook, my camera and tape recorder. In my experience in TV production, the process involved more, more people, like an on-camera host, camera people, video editors, production assistants, even musical scorers. And now that a significant part of my work involves investigative and enterprise reporting, I really feel like I've found my niche. Yeah, and, and certainly as someone who's worked in TV, I, I get the the understanding of that. It can be just you and the editor or editors that you're dealing with. Um, in the Philippines, what is journalism like there? I think for some people who are overseas, they might remember some of the news reports of the Philippines as being one of the most dangerous places in the world for journalists. Um, we still hear stories of Filipino journalists being gunned down, being killed because of their reporting. But at the same time, there is there is a culture there of really promoting free speech and trying to hold powerful people, officials accountable. Is Did anyone in your family work uh, in journalism in any way? No, actually my parents are business people. But my mom was a literature major in college, and I remember when I was in high school, she would write a column for our local paper. And I remember my dad writing poetry and really loving to sing. And so I, I don't know if that in some way influenced my love for, for writing and just communicating with different types of people. So you're, uh, I think, similar in age uh, to me. You have more than 20 years of experience. I mentioned where you've been in the past, and we don't have to go through all those stops. But to mm -hmm. summarize for us, I'm wondering which experiences that you had, both overseas and then I know you were in South Dakota previously, and you had mm -hmm. other jobs in Vermont, which of those were most valuable? First of all, I think that my TV experience has really been helpful, especially at this age now that journalism has become closely tied with social media. And with that multimedia, I've done interview. I've done interviews live streamed on Facebook. I can shoot video for a story, and I realize that I'm always thinking about the visuals for a story, even though my medium now is really mainly print. And when I take pictures at an event I cover, in my mind, I'm trying to see how the photos will appear on screen. I think the other really significant experience that I'm grateful for is that 
When I first started working as a journalist in the U.S., that was in 2016 in Rapid City, South Dakota, the only job available was as a court reporter for the lo local paper. And I remember just being so torn thinking, I need a job, but at the same time, I wasn't even a U.S. citizen then. I didn't grow up. I didn't. I didn't grow up in the country. I wasn't familiar with state law, federal law. So I was like, how am I ever going to do this job properly? But I think it had its advantages coming from the outside because you just ask a lot of questions to better understand the system, and that's really been helpful. Um, and I appreciate that because I have honed my um, court reporting since then, and I continue to do that now here in Vermont. So how did you come to to choose South Dakota as um, where you ended up? It, it's very interesting that I never really thought I'd live in the U.S. My intention was actually to remain in the Philippines because of what um, a high school teacher um, said about brain drain, essentially, a lot of talent, Filipino talent leaving the country. So I thought, you know what, I will stay here because I know there's a need. But then after several years in television, I needed a break. And I decided to go to China to study Mandarin and also to better understand my heritage. And I am half Filipino, half Chinese. And I always felt like I didn't fully understand the Chinese part of me, so I went there. And um, I decided to stay to do reporting work. And during that time was when I met my husband, an American who was also working as a journalist in China. After we got married, he wanted to come back to the U.S. And um, he found a job in South Dakota, which is how that became my first stop after that, he found a job in um, Western Massachusetts, which is how we ended up in New England and Bennington County, which I've been covering since we moved here, is not too far away from where where we live. And that's how I ended up covering Vermont. And from Vermont to the Vermont, uh, from Bennington County to the Vermont Digger, uh, which has been uh, profiled. Some people may be familiar with it from its uh, being profiled by the New Yorker, uh, which said that uh, the only nonprofit that compares in terms of scope and impact is the Texas Tribune, certainly a very strong reputation for covering the entire state of Vermont. Could you explain the, the mission of the Vermont Digger, Digger and how that fits in with what you do there? I can certainly talk about how I perceive our mission from um, from my job as a reporter, we really have a strong focus on accountability journalism, including in um, doing investigative stories, enterprise stories, and our management really has set aside time for everybody to be able to focus on those um, stories stories, being able to do in-depth reporting when necessary. I think one of the things that attracted me to Digger was um, when I was interviewing for the job, I knew the importance of public records. And so one of the things that I asked um, the managing editor was, well, does Digger have a budget for public records? Because I know that that can really amount to hundreds and e even thousands, depending on what you're recording. And I just know that it is an indispensable part of accountability journalism. And I was surprised when uh, the managing editor said, no, we don't have a budget because we're willing to spend whatever it takes if it's necessary. And that made me really happy. And I think that's what sold me to Digger. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that goes back to what was said about uh, it and the Texas Tribune uh, and the um, impressive amount of work uh, that they've done. And we've done a number of interviews recently with reporters uh, who talked about the value of public records, certainly. And you have experience covering uh, public safety. And just to look through some of the pieces that you've done, you did one enterprise piece, one of a bunch of pieces in the digger about issues with sheriffs throughout mm -hmm. the states. You're specifically, you originally wrote about a local sheriff who, and I, I was kind of 
taken aback by this, who appeared to have moved to Tennessee while still holding the job. And then there was a follow-up about a year later about both him and other sheriffs with different issues. Uh, lawmakers are now drafting legislation to better regulate sheriff conduct. Um, can you walk us through from the original idea for the story to the finished uh, product? Sure. This all started when I was working for that local paper in Bennington. After about a year there, I was really puzzled why I had never seen the sheriff, Chad Schmidt, in person, unlike other local officials. I hadn't seen him at public events or bumped into him in town. So I began asking questions until I found someone who mentioned that his family had moved to Tennessee. So with that original tip, I started looking through publicly available documents, and I found through um, a tennis, a state of Tennessee website for um, property records, I found that Sheriff um, Chad Schmidt and his wife bought a lot and a house in Tennessee in 2020, right around the time that um, the, the pandemic started and his public appearances in Vermont dropped off. Um, I also found through uh, Vermont public records that he and his wife dissolved the two businesses that they had in Vermont. They dissolved them in 2020 and 2021. So this was sort of creating a picture of a family kind of transplanting themselves from one state to another. And there were also records online of his wife and his children um, working or attending school in, in Tennessee. All right. So again, I was shocked by this. I was just like, it wasn't like he moved to Massachusetts. He moved to <laughs> he moved to to the South, uh, and he's trying to be a sheriff. Um, all right. So continue. What what else What else happened within this uh, as you, as your reporting uh, continued? Okay. So um, and so one of my main questions during that part one of my um, <clears throat> investigative piece was. Is this is he violating any state laws at all? If if he were indeed living in Tennessee, and the thing is, in Vermont, the state constitution does not explicitly require sheriffs to to even live in the same county. I mean, much less, you know, to be in Vermont. So. Sheriffs and state state's attorneys or district attorneys in what other states would call them, they are allowed to live in a different country from the county where they're elected to serve. And um, and so if you look at the laws and if you were indeed living out of state, then there was really no no violation. And some of the experts I spoke to said that usually you know the courts don't want to intervene they want the voters to make a decision if you're unhappy with how your local official is behaving then you don't re-elect them when the next um election cycle comes along well he decided not to run again he had been in office for <clears throat> since 2009 but last year he decided not to run for election in, this, in the second story that um, was published last month in February, the sheriff, I finally got a chance to speak to the sheriff only the second time that he agreed to speak to me on the phone in, um, I think, since 2020. So the second time I got him on the phone earlier this year, he acknowledged that his wife and his children had moved to Tennessee, but he denied that he spent a significant of time away from Vermont and that he wasn't fulfilling his responsibilities as sheriff. But at the same time, he said that he spent altogether about 100 days, a third of the year, in Tennessee in 2021 and 2022. He was, he was silent on you know, the, the number of days for 2020. And um, so I asked for any public records that would show when he worked in Bennington County in person, because, you know, as public officials, 
they interact with a lot of people. And so I just asked for public documents, just some sort of paper trail proof of these interactions. And he just said he had nothing to show me. He said he was definitely working. He was there, but he just didn't document his public dealings in that way. And that this recent story also looked into how much the sheriff made from his state salary and benefits, as well as administration fees from contracts that the sheriff's department entered into. Because in Vermont, the way that sheriff's departments are set up, they part of their um, annual budget um, comes from public funds, but a bigger part actually comes from money that they themselves make by entering into contracts with both public and private entities. For instance, schools providing security at schools, providing patrol services for different municipalities that don't have their own police departments, um, escorting vehicles and doing other security for, for um, private entities. In terms of something that's instructive to younger journalists, um, mm -hmm. what what are the biggest takeaways from the nuts and bolts of actually trying to do the story? For me, I think one really important thing is that sometimes the information that are super helpful are, are things that are actually out there. For instance, for the first story that I did, I didn't have to do a public records request. Everything was readily available if you just knew where to look, like the Tennessee website, state website, and then the state secretary's website for business registrations. I think for me, that was the biggest thing. And also the importance of maintaining local sources, of being plugged in and knowing what people are talking about and what people know because people have been buzzing for years about where he was asking each other but and then when I, my, my story was published I actually received um, emails from people saying you know we had wondered the same thing but we just never really had um, the time or opportunity to look into it and I feel like with the state of journalism right now I feel really fortunate to have been granted the time and opportunity by Digger to work on this because it took weeks and weeks on and off to piece this together. Yeah, clearly uh, from the date line, the dates of your stories, uh, I did notice that. And it takes a journalist to do uh, to answer the questions that the public can't necessarily get answers to on its own. The other thing that you cover that's prominent are court cases. And you followed one particular case for a couple of years. As it turned out, the longest criminal case in state history, 33 years, related to a conviction of sexual assault being overturned. Um, there were a lot of different layers to this story. What went into the reporting of that? For a long time, Mark, from 2020 up until the defendant died, um, he was a former law enforcement officer in New York who was um, convicted in the 80s of sexually assaulting a minor, but that was overturned by the judge. And um Essentially, the background is that um, for many years, the case re remained active, but nothing really was, was happening to it until prosecutors charged him of lying about his health because his, um, because his claim was that he had, he had a terminal heart ailment that prevented him from undergoing another trial because he claimed that another trial would kill him. And um, so for a long time from when I first started covering it in 2020 up until he died in late 2021, it was just about attending court hearings and just trying to piece together what prosecutors and investigators knew from court documents and what they would say in court. And it wasn't until 
after he died that I was able to interview the prosecutors about what went on behind the scenes when the victim in the case, who is now um, in her 40s, decided to openly talk about what she went through all these decades. I felt that that with the case being the longest running criminal case in Vermont, I felt like it really necessitated this broad view, this look back at the case after it was closed, now that he's passed away. I feel like you're very passionate uh, just from talking about those two stories uh, about, um, I don't even know what the, the exact term would be, like um, the public good, I guess, is the closest thing that I can come to to phrasing what I'm what I'm talking about, um, that that it's like personally important to you and that it's an important part of the job to you that that you're and for the digger uh, in general, that what you're doing is really public serving. Am I am I right in that assessment? Yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. And I guess maybe it's also just my personality that fits in with this kind of work because sometimes it can get, it can get very exhausting, especially when you're trying to chase people who don't want to talk to you or trying to find records that you can't easily get your hands on. But um, yeah, I think there's something that drives me maybe one is to try to give a voice to people who are marginalized that was something that I was very conscious of even in, in high school just that desire to provide a voice to those who are marginalized and also I think just um just this quest for justice Sure, the quest for justice is certainly important uh, to reporters. Now, in addition to covering cops and courts, there are local stories to cover that fall under other designations. When we had Erin O'Hare on a few weeks ago from uh, Charlottesville tomorrow, we talked about the opening of a local bathroom. In your case, uh, I saw a piece, the opening of a grocery uh, in the downtown part of Bennington, one of the, the parts of your state. Uh, where do stories like that fit into what you do? My work is actually um, as a regional reporter. So I cover um, the southwestern part of Vermont. And so that involves just providing a, a big picture view of what's happening. So in essence, I'm a, um, I am also serve as a general assignment reporter looking at um, businesses, um, local government, the school system, and, and, and a bunch of other things that will help people around the state just get a better sense of what's happening in different parts of, of Vermont. And that, that takes on different forms, um, certainly, uh, whether it be covering local business, covering a court case, or investigating uh, a sheriff. Um, in June, you tweeted, an interview yesterday reminded me that sometimes what seems to be the most basic, obvious question can lead to the most unexpected answer that turns a story around and saves me work. That seems like a good lesson for aspiring journalists. Can you tell us more about what happened? Yeah, yeah. Mark, I think I said, the, I think the last line and saves my work because, yeah, I was actually, I just felt, when I, when I tweeted that, I was maybe, part of me was a little bit in shock thinking, you know, I could have potentially made a mistake with my story so what happened was that i was reporting on a um i was reporting on a court case of a of a minor a teenage girl who was charged in um court as an adult and for weeks the for weeks the um the court proceedings revolved around her attorney's request to get her out of adult jail because Vermont no longer has um, a detention center right now for juveniles. And so when it is really necessary 
to detain a minor to keep themselves safe from um, harming themselves or to keep other people around them safe from them, then they are placed in adult jails. That's what we found out. And so there was a hearing there was a the, um, after a hearing where the judge said, OK, I will consider the arguments about whether or not she should remain in adult jail and I'll issue my decision in a few days. And so I was watching out for that decision and I emailed the clerks to try to get a copy of the decision on the day that it came out. And I got, I think, a one page document that suggested that you know she would remain in court and so I wrote that story and I actually had already filed that story I already passed it on to my editors for them to look at before it would be posted online but I also left a message earlier with the prosecutor in the case just asking for a comment but I thought you know well it's pretty straightforward they the state got their request to keep her in jail but then, you know, I spoke to the prosecutor and then at the back of my mind, I was like, this is a really obvious question, but you know what? I'm just going to ask it again. And I was like, so the, the girl is staying in jail, right? And he was like, no, she's not. We didn't, we didn't get a request granted. And I was like, what are you talking about in my head? I was like, what's happening here? And so um, I made another request and I actually got a second document that I think the clerks initially forgot. Either they didn't see it or they forgot to attach it. But that was the real decision in the case that I was writing about that the judge decided to let the girl out of adult jail. And so that was pretty scary. If I, my story had gone out, that would have been, you know, incorrect. Sure. Uh, and that that's uh, that shows the value of exactly what you've talked about. What's the most impactful reporting you've done? Have you done anything that, that changed lives or led to legislation in the towns or cities that you've worked? Well, I think, you know, with court cases, sometimes it's really hard to tell the kind of impact that your writing has or how much your reporting might sway, um, you know, the judge or prosecutors or did or the defense. But I think my reporting on the sheriffs, and certainly it's just one sheriff's department in the past uh, six months, there's been scandals that have emerged from I think about four other sheriff's departments in Vermont. And so because of that, um, state lawmakers are now considering ways to institute reforms in Vermont sheriff's departments. But, you know, one, one factor that lawmakers have brought up is the need to have a way to um, track how much time they're actually spending in Vermont and even to require Vermont residency. And I think that that stemmed from, from the reporting here. How has, uh, so you've been a journalist now for more than uh, 20 years. You've been a journalist abroad and in the States. How has journalism impacted how you view the world? Well, I think that because of my training in getting information in day-to-day -day life you know I believe that uh, you know it's helped me to be more creative just in practical ways in day-to-day -day life and trying to get information but also with a bigger picture when you believe that you're standing for the right thing and there might be injustice whether in my personal life or with people around me that's also made me stronger and more courageous to stand for what I believe is right. That's quite an impact then. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite part of the job? I think it's meeting different types of people. And of course, you know, also the travel that comes with it. Just learning from 
the people that you meet, getting um, getting to better understand um, different experiences that people have, the lives that they lead. And of course, um, just the process of actually writing and weaving together a story, especially when you know you're not under a, a very tight deadline and you have the opportunity to really think about the words that you use to really inject the right the right tone to bring the people into that place and time that you actually saw. I, I think that really gives me a lot of joy. Is there a particular appeal to the state of Vermont? One thing about Vermont, um, and you know, it's only the second state in the U.S. Um, from where I've worked as a journalist, but officials try to be responsive um, when they can on the local and state level. Well, certainly, you know, there are exceptions to the rule to the, I mean there are exceptions to that experience but that's one thing that very early on I noticed that people more easily return my calls here in Vermont and then the other thing is you know in conversation with other reporters who have been working in Vermont longer than I have they've said that in Vermont it seems like change is possible like positive change is possible. And I also don't know if it's because it's a smaller state, but I feel like when there are issues, we can quickly see um, some corresponding changes in uh, or, or related um, bills being introduced in the legislature or agencies trying to respond to local issues. An interesting contrast to the previous week's episode, which was about some of the struggles related to that in the state of Montana. So certainly, uh, Vermont, I, I think I think you are uh, hitting a good point there uh, with Vermont. Um, what's the hardest part of the job? Um, well, right now, I think um, it's because I I have a toddler right now. And I actually, um, and so it's it's hard juggling motherhood with, with a full-time journalism job, you know, especially one where um, I'm constantly striving to produce impactful investigative or enterprise reporting. But I've also seen after... Um, going on maternity leave for three months during the first three months um, um, after I gave birth that I'm certainly happier as a mom being able to do what I love. And I think it makes me a better parent, but there's just that daily struggle of juggling, you know, being able to finish work as quickly as I can so I can spend time with her or sometimes, of course, you know, when it's just a longer day of writing or reporting, then I don't finish until later. Um, so there's that constant juggling, juggling act. And then on the reporting side itself, it's just finding people to talk to you, especially on issues that most of the people mum about, looking for for documents. Yeah, there are just certain stories sometimes when you keep hitting a wall that um, it can sometimes uh, become a little bit bit tiring and sometimes dispiriting. Sure, I'm sure uh, I'm sure that a lot of journalists would say that, and I feel like we could do a whole episode uh, about the uh, trying to be a parent and be a journalist at the same time. But for now, I want to close with our usual closing question. The show is called the Journalism Salute. We salute you and the Digger for your good work, and we ask that you do likewise. With it being Women's History Month, is there a woman journalist in history that you would like to salute for her good work? Yeah, well, one of the women that immediately comes to mind is Catherine Graham. 
you know, I never, like I said, I never expected that I would end up working in the U.S., but um, I read her autobiography um, when I was still working in TV, and it really made an impact thinking how, you know, she ended up being publisher of the Washington Post after her husband died when her life before that was basically taking care of the home and her children. And, you know, especially during that time, it was a man's world, journalism, and it was all men that she was working with. And yet she was able to shepherd the Washington Post through the time um, uh, of the, was it the Pentagon, the Pentagon Papers and also the Watergate? Right. right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So she was able to shepherd the post through that time of um, the Pentagon Papers and um, and Watergate. And I think it was after reading her autobiography that it basically tried to get my hands on everything related to Watergate that, that I could read. Certainly, uh, certainly integral to a journalist's education. And how about a contemporary choice for someone to salute? Ideally, someone you don't work with. Yeah, a person that immediately comes to mind is Marie Aressa of La Rappler and the reporting that they did to speak truth to power. She's a uh, Filipino journalist who who won the Nobel Prize uh, for Peace last year because of her her journalism work, especially um, speaking truth to power against the uh, administration of President Rodrigo Duterte, Duterte in the Philippines. They were reporting on um, extrajudicial killings and just being a critic of against the administration of uh, former Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte, and um, amid the the court cases they that they'd filed against her, that they just um, that the administration filed against her, she remained stead steadfast. Very much so, as we have seen uh, these last few years. Tiffany Tan, we salute you, and we thank you for joining us here on the Journalism Salute. Thank you very much, Mark. It was great to speak with you, and thank you for the work that you do on behalf of journalism. VT Digger is a nonprofit news organization that seeks to tell the story of Vermont. Its slogan is News in Pursuit of Truth. The mission of the Vermont Journalism Trust is to produce rigorous journalism that explains complex issues, promotes public accountability, and fosters democratic and civic engagement. For more information, go to vtdigger.org. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at journalismsalute at gmail.com.